what I uh, end up coming back and watching, especially. If I'm yeah. Doing. Yeah. Well, welcome, everyone. It's great to see everyone again. This is our first uh, virtual workshop of the 2021-2022 season. And after last year, when we had to do it virtually all our workshops. Um, people like the option of being able to tune in without having to travel so much. Um, even with our uh, resuming our in-person conference, we decided to do this again. So right now we have a workshop scheduled just about every other week. We might add some more too if um, different topics come up. I know there was a couple other suggestions recently, so we might be adding some more in. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Erin Silva. I'm an associate professor here at UW-Madison and the state extension specialist in organic agriculture. And I manage the uh, program O-Grain, which is the Organic Grain Resource and Information Network. Um, and it's my pleasure today to introduce two farmers to talk to us about organic alfalfa production. Chris Wilson and Nate Kling were both uh, organic dairy farmers here in Wisconsin um, with uh, you know, substantial um, organic dairies. Um, and, and Nate has a split op operation, both conventional and organic. So that's kind of unique there as well. And organic alfalfa has always come up as a um, topic of interest, um, not only for organic dairy farmers, but even within just general organic grain rotations, having organic alfalfa to help manage weeds and um, have a, another crop in the rotation that's sold off farm um, is you know, always an important part of the crop rotation. So even if there's not livestock in the operation, organic alfalfa is something that um, is definitely an option for more of the commodity grain farmers as well. Uh, and questions related to when to plant and how to plant and terminating alfalfa always seem to be uh, topics of interest on the listserv. So I'm glad that Chris and Nate can talk about this today. And, and as always, we hope to have a, a good discussion. So if you guys have questions or feedback, um, definitely unmute and, and ask um, or put questions in the chat. So we definitely want this to be really interactive and, and get um, other perspectives because as with most things in organic, there's definitely multiple ways to approach things and uh, multiple ways to be successful. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Chris and both Chris and Nate can tell you a little bit about more about their farms and, and their rotations and how they approach things. And uh, then again, we can have a good discussion, hopefully, and um, how other people approach organic alfalfa production. So Chris, take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, Chris Wilson, uh, Southwest Wisconsin. Uh, we have an organic dairy farm that we, um, our family manages, and we manage, all, we produce all the crops and feed for our farm. Um, my role on the farm is more on the management side and then some of the, a lot of data and, and that side of it. So I'll, you know, I'll talk a bit from that frame of that, from that lens, because that's probably the area I'm most comfortable with. If there's something you see or something you hear, please, you know, and, and you get questions or you want to cut anything off at any point, um, that it, on the subject we're on and jump in please do so because i you know i think questions and and trying to get to where you guys are at and and in the discussion is going to be way more interesting way more useful um i'll lead it off here with some with uh i got a slide deck and i'll i'll talk to for i know there's a lot of people jumping on by phone so i'll do my best to kind of explain um maybe what uh what is maybe on the screen um, so hopefully everybody can see my, my screen here with the slide deck. Um, again, um, we're a, our dairy farm in Southwest Wisconsin. So we have, uh, we have livestock that, that we raise, uh, alfalfa. We, we don't sell a whole lot off the farm. Most of all the forages we grow are, are for our farm. Um, there, you know, there may be some seasons where we will look to to sell. Ideally, a lot of times we're looking to sell out of the out of the field. Um, I think one of the big things for us as we look at, at our management side of it is really trying to trying to understand the the labor flows within our operation. So a lot of the decisions that we make um, 
are based around trying to trying to flatten the curve on on labor and field work in the spring and and uh you know so a lot of times first crop and then and then uh new seeding um and that new seeding harvesting are actually some of the the timing on that are, are super important aspects um the first area i'll just kind of jump into when we think about the seeding side of alfalfa production um in our operation we're typically seeding alfalfa in the spring um and we're typically doing it after a soybean crop um so we've got that soybean double um you know a, a rotation that that might fit into would be like corn silage wheat soybeans new seeding and then a couple three years of alfalfa or if we take the wheat out, then it'd be corn, soybeans, um, and then a seeding year and, and two or three years of alfalfa. Um, in our operation, we, we typically will spring plant with the companion crop, um, spring barley, triticale, oats, peas, oats and peas, uh, are some various mixes that we've used predominantly. Um, the the we we often will also do alfalfa in a mixture so i think that that's another thing that we 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 try to to do is we incorporate a lot of times it if it's if it's silage based we'll a lot of times go with uh an earlier harvest which typically then we'll use a, a tall fescue um so ftf stf 43 is, is a pretty common um seed type dairy master that we incorporate in a mix um if it's a little bit in our operation we have kind of a home farm and then further away farms that that we manage if it's further away we'll typically include a timothy or possibly a clover especially if it's on a ground that has ph problems that we worry about stand quality um and tank we'll we'll include those mixes um the timothy gives us a longer harvest window before that especially in the spring get, gets to be uh, a quality a major quality problem then whereas a tall fescue you know it can get away from you in a hurry if you if you really aren't on top of it um i won't talk too much about uh you know how i'm not gonna be super <laughs> a lot of expertise on on the physical planning side of it um i fortunately have a pretty big family and we all have our strengths and i'm not super mechanical so i'll say that right out of the gate um the one thing that i will say just on the seating side that i think is important is is especially with more seat co coatings and seatings and and a lot a lot more variation i would say on the organic side and germ rates um for seed is it's really important i think to run the math on how much pure live seed that you're getting out there um and 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 make sure that you're getting um getting the right the right rates out in those fields so that you're you know that your time that you're investing in all that and, and then hopefully the years ahead of you you're getting you know a really good start i think for our farm what we look at is 10 pounds of pure live seed is kind of a minimum um and i just threw an example out there of, of a seed you know a seed tag that i pulled that we would run the math at where it's it's you know it's it's roughly a third seed coating um and then a two-thirds pure live seed um or pure seed i see i meant and then the germ rate on that is about 75 percent. so you run that and basically that takes about that that uh, seed coating and loss of germ or lower germ rate you're about half of those pounds effectively um is what nets out to so if you plant 20 pounds an acre you're right about 10 pounds of pure live seed um so i think that that's something that we you know what we kind of practice you know as we look at all of our seeds that we use um as far as timing we're typically trying to get out there as soon as the conditions are are good on the ground um temperature is usually not super important on our end if we if we can get out there as last year i mean we were 
we were starting the plan on April 1st, which was probably about as early as maybe 2012 is sooner, but um, typically it's that first half of April for our area in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, we also try not to, if it's too wet, we try to stay patient. So I think you, you kind of, every farm's different, every piece of ground's different, you kind of make that judgment. We, a lot of times will try to target certain ground that we know is gonna be ready ahead of others in our planning. Um, so I think that, that that's typically what we do. Um, and then we take on our new seeding, spring new seeding, we will let some of the companion crop go to grain, spring barley, um, grain, and then the rest of it, we will take off for forage as a cutting in, um, ideally in that, you know, in that, um, in that, uh, in that boot stage, which I'll kind of hit on in a minute. Uh, summer seeding, we have done some of that, but certainly a lot less. I mean, as a scale 90, upper 90% of our ground, we typically spring seed. Um, we see a lot of success with summer seeding. Our experience has been that um, we typically grow more soybeans than, than, than wheat. So just from a rotation standpoint, that's maybe less, we have less acres where that's, a, that we utilize that option. Um, we get a lot of use off of that, that spring seeding forage. So within our cattle operation, our dairy operation. Um, so I think that that, that's something that for us, the spring seeding just works better. We get better stands consistently from the spring. Um, the summer seeing, we've had some really good ones, but we've also had our share of, of failures on that end. So um, I know timing's probably more important in that summer seeding. Usually your window is is in that, that for us, it would be more like the, that first half of August um, is kind of your optimal window. And, and if you reach before that, you got some moisture you're kind of rolling the dice a little bit more on heat and moisture. If you get past that, then you're rolling the dice a little bit on on when that first hard frost is gonna come in and whether you get a crown established and and the maturity on that plant. Um, every region's a little bit different on the timing. Uh, but you know, I think I think that that's critical for that summer seeding. And then the other thing we've shown with is you know how how much of a companion crop to plant with it so that you're not, um, in the spring we don't worry so much because a lot of times we get that crop off, it's got another, you know, two, three months of growth before it, it hits winter. Whereas that summer seeding, you know, how much you can compete with the companion crop is always a little bit, it's something we were still struggling with, maybe mastering our farm on those seedings. Um, and we typically will, we will, if we plant a companion crop, which is what we've done so far, uh, we will usually take that off just so it doesn't smother over the um, So I'll kind of race through these next few slides. Um, for us, first crop cutting is kind of sets the table for the year uh, when we're looking at established crops. Every year is different. I took this photo because it's, it, I, do a lot of scouting in the spring and it just happened to be that the tape measure from 2020 and 2021 were 17 inches when I took it. The one from 2021 was a May 7th picture and the one from 2020 was a May 18th picture. So it just shows that, you know, you can have a lot of variation crop to crop um, year to year. And it's good to kind of have a plan and have an understanding of, of what targets you're hitting, whether it's a date or maturity level um, and how that's going to impact, uh, impact the flow. Um, I also will use growing degree day units to kind of figure out where the trajectory is and roughly where that um, crop maturity comes in. So a lot of times I'm targeting, you know, as of when I could maybe start cutting um, for our operation would be from April 1st, or uh, excuse me, from March 1st through uh, forward, um, alfalfa growing degree days, I'm targeting 600 as, as a potential starting point. 
I threw this in there just kind of point out again, you know, there was about a nine days difference in between 20 and 2021 on when that date was hit. I think in 2021, that was like May 18th or 19th. And then 2020, it was May 27th, um, which again, for us, that nine days difference, it definitely changes the whole flow of the, the spring for us because we got corn planting, bean plantings, all those different variables. Um, so that's something we spent a lot of time on from like a thinking manager standpoint. Um, I, the other aspect being a dairy is that that quality side has, we put a lot of emphasis in, 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 in trying to target a high quality with that trade-off on, on workflow. So for us, um, we're really trying to at least get going early enough that the crop doesn't get ahead of us. Um, we had 880 acres of alfalfa this last year. Um, we can put up maybe two or 300 acres in a day. Good day. Uh, first crops probably less. You know, uh, a lot of times I think in tons, but you know, early cutting, we might be able to do two, 250 in a day, but by the time you get to the end of that first crop, I mean, if you can get 125 up, it seems like it's a good day. So for first crop, especially, we're trying to get in there early, even if that, that trade-off is, is that, you know, we give up quite a bit of cut uh, tonnage on that first, on those first couple of days of work, um, just because the years that we let that first crop get ahead of us, you know, it, it draws out well into June for us. And we, it just impacts too many other things. So we always kind of err on the side of cutting too soon and too late. But again, I think every farm is different. Um, the slide I have up here on the left is, I'll call it my crude estimate of, of how quality impacts um, our milk production because we do feed, uh, you know, we have a forage ration that's typically 70%. Um, give or take. And it's a big chunk of that is, is alfalfa forage. And that we see a, a pretty linear impact if we're feeding really high quality feed versus low quality feed. And, and again, I'm, you know, there's a lot of nuances to that. I mean, you have, it's more than just, you know, digestibility. There's other characteristics that go into it and cow health, but just generally speaking, um, if we put up 200 relative feed value hay um, versus 125 relative feed value hay, that every five points for us uh, is worth $15 a ton. Um, so that for us, our goal is always about 160, 180. And that's where if we, and, and if we can put up most of our first crop above 150, then we're we're pretty happy. So a lot of times that means that early, that first day's worth of work is probably gonna be 200 and that hopefully the last day's worth of work isn't, isn't much below 150 is our goal. Um, the slide or the section on the right of this slide is kind of a monetary estimate of, of on an average year, you know, what is the sweet spot for us? If we could harvest all of our hay on one day, what would it be versus for us, it, we need seven good harvest days, we figure, to, to, to nail a first crop. Um, you, typically, that last half of May, you, you should figure that you're going to have, in a seven-day week, you're going to have three to four um, field work days is kind of the general data term. And that doesn't always mean like, you know, I mean, if you put hay up, you know, just because you have one sunny day doesn't necessarily make it a good hang, you know, a good hang day. You got to kind of consider what, um, what the, you know, what you really need that three, four day window that works well. So you can drop the hay down and get it up. Now, you know, one of the things on our farm that we do put a strong emphasis on is just being able to put up haze, cut it and, and get that, sun on it and spread that swath out as much as you can and, and get it up. But it, I, I just from 
experience, I mean, if you have a wet ground, if you've got, uh, you've got the forecast I always feel like in May is, it changes more than any other month it feels like. And maybe that's just because we're always trying to do so much, but I mean, they can call for sun, uh, you know, tomorrow and it may end up being cloudy half the day. And, and what you thought you were gonna cut in the morning and start chopping by the evening, you know, you know, doesn't always work out that way. So you kind of, the metrics we look for is, is ideally if we can get a two or three day window, then we'll get at it and, and try to be aggressive. We're looking hopefully to cut that, that first cutting. You know, when we start to see a bud out there, it's, you know, you probably definitely want to, for us, we want to get going. Um, now, if you could put your hay up in two or three days, then maybe, you know, then maybe you look, look to give yourself a little bit later window. Um, the maximum value from what we look at on our dairy and what it translates into milk production is roughly that mid bud stage where you're getting good tonnage, but, um, but the quality is still pretty good. And, um, you know, I think there's different, there's different tools, especially in first crop where, you know, you can use the peak method or, um, or, or kind of what stage you're in. You know, I, I think there's a lot of information out there. I won't harp on that too much unless people have questions. Um, and our goal is anything that's going to stay in production. Uh, we'd like to get four cuttings by the end of August. Um, and then if, if we know it's going to cycle in the corn the next year, then we'll take a fifth cutting usually in October. Um, so there's that side of it. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's kind of the same thing on the new seeding. Um, we're, we typically, we chop a lot of our new seeding. We're typically trying to hit a mid boot stage uh, to late boot stage on a lot of our new seeding. Uh, the thing about a grain crop is it does not take long in June to go from boot stage to milk stage. So, you know, again, if you can cut it early, that's what we do. Um, we just invariably because of our operation and we know we're going to have crops that get away from us and we know we're going to have dry cow heifer feed from someplace. So if we have the choice of taking it too soon or too late, we typically will err on too soon. But the big, the big message is, is that um, in about five days, you can go with warm weather, you can go from, you know, boot stage and close to milk stage and your yields are going to probably double on that, but your quality is also going to drop significantly. So um, for us, well, we'd rather have less tons of higher quality and just get out of the field sooner and on to weed management and corn soybeans. Um, these are just kind of some general points, but uh, you know, if you really want that, that swath to drive quickly, spread it out as much as you can. Um, and, yeah, much of that. Um, I guess, is there anything, any questions on that before I maybe just talk lightly about our nutrient management side of it and then hand it over to Nate? Um, I feel free to put questions in the chat too, and I'm happy to relay those if uh, people want to just type your questions in and I'm keeping an eye on the chat if, if that's an easier way to ask questions. Yeah, and I'm going to try to wrap up here in about three minutes so we can keep time. Um, so the other aspect of what I, I help a lot with on is just on the soil management side. Um, you know, I think this is an area that we historically maybe haven't done as well as we should. And it's an area that we put a lot of effort in the last three or four years. And, and we've seen, we've seen the impacts in a positive way from that focus. So distilling it down for us, uh, we started soil sampling, grid sampling, basically all of our farms every four to five years and getting, a, getting just a really nice big picture of where, where we're at on our nutrient levels. And uh, a lot of farms that have been hayed for basically their entire 
existence. Um, you know, they if you don't if you don't maintenance them or or make sure that you're getting that that uh, return nutrients, you can get below, especially on your K and, and P, uh, below some some minimum levels pretty quickly, and that has a very material impact on your bottom line, your yield. Um, so we put a lot of effort effort in trying to make sure that we are we are investing in the right places, um, and then the key areas that we're looking at is probably pH because that's an easy one to fix, and then um, your potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, boron um, as kind of your macros and, and initial micro. Uh, we don't have magnesium, calcium problems, those things that too much in our area. If anything, we've got probably too high levels, um, but every area is different. So I think getting, getting your arms around that and then the manure management plays into that. The products we use outside of manure, gypsum, sulfate, potassium, um, and then blends. And the biology side is definitely a big focus for us. Um, and that's kind of that big picture of, of in, including cover crops, manure in the right rotation and then getting uh trying to reduce that tillage as best you can within a long-term rotation so yeah i have uh, a I'll, question I'll about that chris i i know that one of the concerns um about alfalfa management um particularly in more of again the cash grain rotation um one thing i've heard about putting alfalfa in a cash grain rotation and more looking at it for from an income standpoint, I guess, is that the where you're going to see more of a market premium is the high quality alfalfa. And that's where I think some of your comments about, you know, where when to cut for high quality and some of those trade-offs of cutting for quality versus yield are important. Cause I I know the alfalfa, organic alfalfa market can vary, but where it seems to be more consistent in price is, is when you're looking at getting that high feed quality and, and selling to dairy farms. But one of the other concerns, I guess, in terms of putting alfalfa in a grain rotation without livestock is how much selling that alfalfa is mining nutrients. And I guess, you know, and being familiar with your farming operation, you do have some rented ground that's um, quite a distance from the where the animals are housed and it's not like you can easily bring the manure and have more of that recycling or you know, have you noticed a difference in terms of your fertility management or you know, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. with absolutely. that further ground, I guess, versus the ground that you're able to haul the dairy manure onto. Yep, absolutely. And I think, I think that that's, I think that's a big thing of, of just, for us, making sure that we are being concerted what we're doing from that nutrient load. Um, you know, we tr we're trying to optimize our manure more effectively uh, and putting it in the right places so that it's it's targeting needs. Um, so even even where we do have dairy manure, I think it's important to, to scrutinize that stuff. Uh, but like you were reiterating, away from you know where you don't have that manure, or if you're a crop farmer that is including it in a rotation for rotate, rotation benefits. Uh, you need to have a strategy in place to make sure that you are, um, that you're maintaining that, that soil or you're gonna see an impact on not just your alfalfa, but all the crops down the line. And um, I threw in here some targets that we look at and for us, if we have phosphorus below 10 or potassium below 100, uh, those are two huge red flags. I mean, if we have ground at those levels uh, in our in our grid sampling, then then we are, you know, we're we're really focused on making sure that we're at least feeding the crop that's there what it needs for that year because we are seeing, you know, that's paying for itself two three x in those situations. Um, the long-term play strategy in organics is that I also feel like there's opportunities, especially with cover crops, to, to, to let the soil biology, let, let, um, let the system work to your advantage on those farms as well. So, you know, practice uh, trial and error with different types of tillage uh, 
tillage type cover crops and um, in that the other thing that we try to do on those farms is we if we have a deficit we don't try to fix it in a year we have you know kind of a 10-year plan to, that if we can every crop year uh, kind of feed that crop and, 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 and layer it in we're feeding the crop in that year but then hopefully building building it back up to where it needs to be for stability so and that's an excellent point with just generally with organic fertility management is that unlike in conventional systems where honestly on an annual basis, I think there is more of a mindset of fixing things quickly with organic and the nature of organic inputs. Oftentimes it is more of a long game where it may take five or 10 years to, to start to see things equilibrate and get to the levels you want. And partly because of the biology, partly and the mineralization, partly because of the cost with some of the inputs, particularly when you are on um, ground where dairy manure might not be an option and the cost of composite poultry manure, if you're adding like soft rock phosphate, it's just a, it's a longer game when you think of like getting those levels to where you want to and then keeping those consistent, particularly when you're going into ground like newer rented ground that may be suboptimal or transition ground. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think that we've seen, you know, some of the, if you have ground that's just overall deficient, low organic matter ground, um, low nutrient ground, it, you just might as well buckle up for it being a, a really long-term process in the organic system um, to build that up. Uh, you know, I, we've got ground that is, you know, just throw a number out there that's got for us a higher soil organic matter, maybe around 4%, but yet it's, you know, it's um, 80 parts per million potassium. And that ground is, I'm, that ground I'll go out and we'll, we'll get a heavy dose, you know, three, 400 pounds of sulfate of potassium um, in that seeding year. And it, those first two years of alfalfa, you'll get that money back, you know, right away on that example. But um, but it, you know, I think a ground that you're starting with say two, two and a half percent or soil organic matter and, and is deficient broadly, then, then you need to, to certainly have a, uh, all those other tools in the toolkit to, to try to correct that over the long run and, and get that to a healthier, healthier position overall. I guess I would love to get, I'd like to get Nate in here. So I'm gonna kind of cut myself off on a more and um, we can kind of circle back on anything else I talked about. Sounds good. Thank you, Chris. So Nate, if, if you wanna unmute and if you're not already unmuted and tell us a little bit about your farm. And um, I, I think it's interesting, particularly that you have a, a, you know, a parallel operation with both conventional and organic crops and animals and, and how you approach um, alfalfa as a crop on your farm. Sure. Um, yeah, my name's Nathan Kling. Uh, we farm in Taylor, Wisconsin, kind of west central part of the state. Um, most of our soils are uh, sandy to sandy loam soils, so fairly light ground, low organic matters. Um, we have two dairies. Uh, we have an organic dairy, about 280 cows, and we also, uh, in 2018, we bought the neighboring dairy. We were milking another 280 cows with a robot facility there. Um, the reason we bought that was a lot of land came with it, about 800 acres. Um, so right next door is hard to um, turn our back to that. So we, we bit the bullet and did that. Uh, we've gotten all the ground um, certified organic now for both farms. We're farming about 1,700 acres uh, organically. Um, the way we do the crops, there's about 400 acres of corn, um, about 20 acres of rye we grow as a grain crop just for our own cover crop seed. Um, there's about 340 acres of pasture for the organic grazing herd and then the balance is in hay ground. So we usually have about 900, 950 acres of hay um, that we run each year. Um, uh, that's kind of our operation here. We also do some custom harvesting. We do all of our own crops. Um, me and a bunch of employees here. I don't have any other family involved with it. 
Um, I guess going back to the alfalfa, um, we generally spring seed everything here. Um, in the past, we had done a lot of peas and triticale um, as a nurse crop um, because we liked that as feed. Uh, it was a couple years we had, one year we struggled, I don't know if it's bad germination or what, but the triticale didn't come through and the following year the peas didn't come through. So then two years ago, um, I guess we'd been harvesting some uh, crops for a friend of mine who works, uh, he's a buyer and seed dealer and he does all these grass mixes and he talked us into trying the fistolium as a nurse crop. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm on the fence on it at this point in time. I think it worked better in a conventional situation because of the uh, um, ability to put nitrogen to it and stuff. I think we're limited on nitrogen in that aspect in our scheme of things here. Uh, we were putting two pounds of it down. It grew, but it didn't get the tonnage that we were hoping for or the quality uh, in that new seeding. So this coming year, we're going to go back to doing uh, uh, peas and triticale nurse crop on our hay ground. Um, our basic uh, well, last year's concoction, what we seeded was two pounds of astolium, three pounds of SDF 43 tall fescue, um, eight pounds of red clover, and 10 pounds of alfalfa. Um, the other reason we did that was with season 300 acres down every year. Uh, it's a lot of passes and the way we did it before, we put the oats and the grass down with a grain drill and then we came back with a second pass with the alfalfa and clovers and a, a brilliant cultipacker. Um, 12 feet at a time got to be slow, uh, especially two passes. So we bought a 15 foot no-till drill two years ago. Um, not as impressed with the seeding as I was with the brilliant, I guess, at this point. Um, we've struggled. I don't know if the alfalfa is getting in too deep with that. We've got it set as shallow as we can go. Uh, we put it in with a no-till drill, and then we also um, run a brilliant cultipacker. Uh, we rent the neighbors, got a 30-footer, and we roll it. Um, I like smooth fields, and we seed alfalfa down uh, because we make a lot of trips over them, and we want to do it fast to get it up in a timely manner. Um, so that's what we've been doing the last this year a lot of the alfalfa um, just didn't come through we had the clover came through phenomenal and so I guess uh, uh, that was one question I was going to pose to the group here um, in an organic standpoint is um, is it worth planting alfalfa I guess and I guess the reason I question that is because of the short rotations we run uh, seems like it's uh, the first year is kind of uh, always a disappointing harvest for us here and then you only got it for two years it's more costly to plant and I guess with these newer improved clovers uh, especially the red clovers out there uh, we're seeing the tonnage uh, that we want um, I guess the one downfall we do see is the red clovers maybe not as drought tolerant as what the alfalfa is um, on these lighter soils we have here but um, I guess it's something we're considering is for this coming year is not planting alfalfa in all of the fields to do kind of more side by side comparison that way and stuff. It'd be more of just a red clover, tall fescue, um, maybe some Timothy or brome in there, or orchard grass would probably be included in there also. Um, I'm just feel free to ask any questions. I don't have a polished speech here. I'm just kind of giving a background of what we do here. Um, all of our hay is uh, put up for our dairies. Um, most of it's chopped. Some is done as baleage for um, some of our heifers that we outwinter on pasture. We do baleage for them. Uh, it's just easier. We don't have to run it through a mix or anything. So we and then with the two dairies what we do is we take uh, first crop well second crop goes to the uh, uh, conventional dairy in a in a pile. Um, third crop will come back to the organic dairy, and then fourth crop kind of gets split sometimes depending on where we're at um, for for feed volumes and where we need it. Um, I guess we always prioritize it toward the uh, organic dairy because we can buy conventional feed. Uh, I found is more readily available if we need to. Uh, we also buy all our dry grain for the conventional dairy and um, a little bit of corn silage. Uh, we do take, so all the haylage is fed over there is organic and three quarters of the corn silage is grown organically for that dairy. Um, in 
someday maybe we'll convert that to organic too. I guess it's running pretty well the way it is right now as a confinement dairy. Um, I guess with the fertility program for our alfalfa, uh, we maintain everything at a seven pH, I guess, on these sandy soils. I think having that plus good fertility, it really increases the life of the stand. We do a four cut system here and um, rarely do we ever have any winter kill. Um, I guess I kind of cringe. I've only been organic since 2017 here. And so our crop rotation used to be um, two to three years of corn or corn silage. Uh, and then uh, a seeding year with three to four years of hay. Uh, we always had good stands. Now I'm cringing at turning down, you know, three year old stand of hay to put corn in. I guess I realize that we need that for the nitrogen credits on the organic side, but um, still uh, <laughs> to see that, I guess. So um, I'm getting used to it. But the pH, uh, we use all high cal lime here. Um, it's, it's fairly reasonable to put on. Um, it's more readily available for us. Um, so that's what we've gone to doing. Um, we use a lot, uh, we hardly any commercial fertilizer. I think I bought 25 ton of sulfate of potash for one rented farm that we don't get a lot of manure on this year. But um, we buy in some chicken litter. Um, we have access to a neighboring hog farm. We get a million gallons of liquid hog manure in the spring. Most of that goes on uh, corn ground in the spring. And then we have the 550 dairy cows plus all the young stuff. It's all bed pack. Um, so we get point throughout the year. Um, and then one thing we found too um, is we buy a lot of bedding. Um, I guess. I think it's a cheap fertilizer source because you, you buy it as bedding, but you're also getting the organic matter uh, in that uh, bedding you buy, plus all the, there's some, some potash and stuff that comes along with it. Um, so I think for what we're exporting in meat and dairy, uh, we're able to buy that back to keep our soils instead of having to buy commercials. Um, let me think what else. Um, I guess the goal with all the, the, the haylage we harvest here, uh, our goal is to all put up all dairy quality feed, um, knowing that we're going to end up with some heifer feed eventually. Um, most of our new seeding is all put up, uh, or that's what's used as heifer feed. Uh, we'll do some baleage out of that generally. And uh, I think what else? So Tyler put a comment in the chat that um, that he's tried. They've tried some of the newer, faster dry down clovers and weren't real impressed with the dry down. And uh, the drought really took a toll on the clover while the alfalfa remained strong. Um, yeah, there's an interesting trade offs. One thing I, I had heard, too, about your clover versus alfalfa or other alternative forage legumes or again, we're looking at just kind of that more perennial phase of the rotation in organic grain, which is not only important for the fertility, but the weeds that um, are there certain parts of our state, and this is obviously going to differ across the country, but alfalfa has in certain areas taken a real hit on winter kill. And I think the clovers tend to be a little bit more resistant or resilient when we uh, have some of the winter weather, that open ground or really cold weather where the alfalfa tends to tends to struggle a little bit more with some of that harsher um, winter weather if we don't have good snow cover. So yeah, there's certain weather patterns where alfalfa is going to shine. And we certainly saw a lot of drought this year. And there may be certain weather patterns where red clover is going to shine. And some of those areas in the state that have had al alfalfa winter kill, it's like clover just comes up as a weed. <laughs> it's actually hard to yep. get rid of. Um, yeah, so interesting trade-offs there. Thank you, Tyler, for sharing that. Um, don't know if anyone and else we, had experiences. We have used a lot of the freedom red clover, um, and I've been pretty happy with the results we've seen on that uh, variety here. Um, we don't do any dry hay, so I guess that's not a concern, but uh, what I've found is it it probably catches us off guard on a real hot day how fast it dries even when we're harvesting it for silage and stuff so um, that was something I think it was 
second crop, we had some really excellent drying weather and we were a day behind the mower chopping and it was down at 50% already and stuff. So uh, we lay it out wide. Um, if the weather isn't ideal, we'll tend to hay too, but um, I guess I've been happy with it so far. Mm -hmm. uh, like our experience with clover is a little bit mixed. Um, we definitely have challenges with first crop clover getting it put up as baleage. Uh, you know, if there's a wet ground after a rain, it, it just seems like it doesn't doesn't dry. It just kind of mats up and we don't have a tether, so that's probably one thing maybe that that would help on that end. But um, we've been, you know, I think for us in our area, I think the disease package on the on the alfalfa varieties is seems to be correlating more with our winter survival. We've had certainly have had some winter kill problems over the last few years. Um, and I always butcher the name of this disease, but that's uh, the amphromyces or whatever they- Yeah, had. yeah. If, the yeah, I know, <laughs> I should know too. It starts with an A. I get mixed yeah. up with anthracnos versus the phanomyces. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's an interesting observation, Chris, because the winter kill could be tied with you know, roots, root diseases. And if you have those root diseases, you're gonna have greater winter kill. So if you get, disease, you know, um, varieties that are more resistant to diseases that could, you know, indirectly help with winter survival. Yep. And that's what we've seen. We've put a lot of emphasis on, on that side of the disease baggage, the, you know, races one, two, and, and three, if we can get it. Uh, and those varieties have held up a lot better for us in our area. And I know we are in Southwest Wisconsin, a hotbed for that disease challenge, that root disease challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so every area is different. And, and I think that that, what Nate said, I mean, I think it really kind of, what that mix is and what that focus is, is, is very, very, you know, area dependent and soil dependent. And I think everybody should really try to figure out what works best for them on that end. Yeah. So Eric just put a question, and Eric, this was going to be my next question for these guys too, or whoever else wants to chime in. Um, talk about spring termination of alfalfa or cl clover prior to organic corn, preferred tools or methods, or just in general termination of alfalfa. That always comes up as a topic of interest. Um, I guess uh, we've tried about everything here. Um... I guess we had a high speed disc. I wasn't real impressed with how the alfalfa kill was with that one. Um, maybe we didn't have it deep enough. Um, I've gone to just, uh, we bought a big disc with 24 inch blades. We'll go over it twice with that. Um, and then uh, field cult or soil finish it. Uh, we like nice seed beds. Um, this year we did buy a six bottom rollover plow. Um, that seems to, uh, the weed pressure in the corn that we had plowed is definitely less than where we had disked the, the sod under and stuff. So we'll be using that in the future again. So was that all spring termination? Are you doing any anything in the fall to kind of uh, 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 quicken any spring uh, activities to prepare the for corn? We do all spring termination here. Okay. I don't like to leave the ground exposed in the winter that way. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I mean, we if we if we have dairy manure going on ground that we have to tank on, we will typically incorporate that in the fall. Um, it depends a little bit if it's on a heavy contour and we're leaving that full contour exposed. We typically will we try not to spread manure on fall on the, that ground, and, and and then we you know we won't work that ground in, in the fall. Um, but if we've got ground that we can get. Uh, that we, we have to go somewhere with manure and it's not knifed in, um, then we typically will will use a, incorporate that. We, one of our harder passes is typically alfalfa in the corn, we just with our rotation. So we, we use a, a disc ripper that 
fully incorporates it. And we're pretty pleased with that. I mean, the one thing, uh, and, and I agree with Nate, you know, keeping the ground covered is definitely a big goal, but with that manure application too, we wanna make sure that, that we're not seeing nutrient runoff in those instances and that they're, you know, that we're trying to keep that nutrient in place as best we can. And if anyone else wants to chime in on the chat or unmute too, I know every, how people terminate alfalfa and what tools they use and you know, what, when they do it, how many passes. And that's, that's always a question that, that people tend to have. So I, I think, Nate, you might be on a bit lighter ground than what you are, Chris. You might have a bit heavier soils where you are, I think. We do, we got some heavy soils. And I mean, typically, Typically the fall passes, you know, the, the, the negative is, is that it's a, you know, it's basically sitting idle from when you work it through that planting date in May, often years. Um, so it, if that's the negative, but this year we had basically a spring drought and, and we saw all that ground because it, you know, it, 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 uh, it had that nitrogen captive and wasn't, sucking the moisture out of that ground did a lot better than the spring incorporated ground. But I think that that's really year to year and farm to farm. Our ground that's away from home, we spring, we will, we usually try to work it up in that first 10 days of May with, to incorporate and then we'll, we'll come back over it with, a, um, with a vertical till, uh, ideally, and then, and then plant it. Um, a lot of times our spring, spring vertical, we might have to do two passes with the vertical till on our heavier ground with anything that's spring, spring incorporated. So Tyler put in the chat another question. Um, have either of you experimented with no-tilling alfalfa and clover grass mixtures into winter cereals in the early spring? Um, so this is, I'm imagining Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so you're taught like, um, it, it could be potentially a um, frost seeding, but I know they could also be using, I guess, um, a drill to at that kind of same strategy of frost seeding, under seeding clover into a winter cereal or alfalfa into winter cereal. We, we, uh, yes, I actually tr tried it on 10 acres this past spring. Uh, it was a uh, winter rye, it was a pretty good stand of winter rye. Uh, we drilled it in, I think, about the first week of May. Um, it was a disaster. It, the alfalfa just didn't catch for some reason. I don't know if there was if, uh, too much competition from the rye. Uh, we cut the rye about, uh, well, right after first crops, I would say about the 5th or 6th of June. Um, we probably should have let it get the head or the anthesis because it did uh, volunteer back pretty well. But um, yeah, that'll, uh, we just spread manure on it after that this summer. It just, no, no, no alfalfa there. So I don't know what we did wrong, but it didn't work for us. Chris? We, we tried, um, we had one field with one rotation that happened to work out where um, we had corn and then yellow peas. And unfortunately, yellow peas kind of got late. And so we, we didn't have a cover crop in behind them and we'd no-till alfalfa with the companion barley crop into that field in 2019 and it 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 was a clean field for the spring and we got in there it was the first field we planted and that that took well and and it was a good stand but I, it's certainly certainly very risky and situational i would say yeah, I think the way the cost of seed there. Um, yep. I, I've heard of farmers, and I guess Seth put this in too, that, that he's had some of his best stands no-tilling alfalfa into a light cover crop of rye in early April and then harvesting the rye about three weeks later to get rid of competition. And similarly, I, I've, I've heard of people being successful with this. I think the, the keys are like Seth um, put in versus you know, your approach, Nate, is to go in early, like approach it more like a, 
a frost seeding where you're getting in there late March, early April. So um, there's more light that can come down there and help that crop get established. And I think too, that light cover crop is key because you need enough light getting in there that it isn't completely smothered out. And um, so either, you know, a lighter seeding rate which is again, there's gonna be trade-offs there, but also I think that there's certain crops like winter wheat where it might work better than rye because rye is just so, so aggressive. And uh, like, if you have a winter wheat, just there's more light going down there. So just, yeah, strategizing the planting date and the seeding rate and, and what crop you're using to just make sure you're, you're getting enough light and enough period of light that you can get it. Um, uh, germinated and up. Um, I'm not as familiar with alfalfa in this method as red clover, but as long as that red clover kind of gets germinated and started, it just kind of stays dormant under there. And you can even wait till grain harvest and it will, it will come back as long as it it's, it germinates. Um, but alfalfa I'm a little less familiar with, but where I have heard, it's more like what Seth is describing here of, uh, going in early and with a crop where it's just going to be a little less competitive than rye. The other strategy I was going to just uh, mention, we had a field day um, at Will Peasley's farm and his dad's farm up uh, in Black River Falls. And we were talking about this as a strategy too of either doing like a summer annual forage or um, a winter cereal grain. And you always have to kind of assess a situation for what it is. Um, but potentially like doing a no tilling of a late summer alfalfa into there. So, um, uh, so if you, but the key is there that like you have to assess the weed pressure, obviously, and you have to kind of go in and no till it right away. I mean, there's always going to be a certain level of risk in anything you do in organic, but if you're going to no till into a harvested winter cereal grain, yeah, you need a pretty clean stand and you need to do that no tilling, like come right back, turn right back around and no till it right away. But that's another option in terms of looking at kind of extending out no till phases in organic. Um, and uh, yeah, either, you know, no-till alfalfa into a crop or then using potentially, um, yeah, either that spring or, or fall, or I call it fall, but it's really late summer strategy. Um, and John wrote in that he's had luck grazing it hard in late winter, then rototilling two inches in the winter for termination, not turning much un they're green, but effective termination and mineral tillage. That's, it's interesting, John. I love these kind of like all outside the box thinking of minimal tillage. Um, Cause I, I think this is, you know, where we need to go. Trying to do a zero till system in organic is going to be really, really hard. But um, I think there's a lot of creative ways, like, like John mentioned, or even, you know, Seth, how do we kind of lengthen the time periods between tillage or look at, you know, minimal tillage in terms of depth or, or when we're applying those tillages, tillage passes, I guess. Question I have is, does anybody uh, no-till uh, alfalfa into corn ground in the spring that had been, I guess that the problem I come come across is the corn ground is so ridged up and rough um, from cultivation on the organic and that it's not something I'd want to uh, pay for many years and I wonder if anybody's got a, a good way of accomplishing that. Yeah that's been that concern I have heard too Nate that in that the the concern is not even so much getting it established but yeah having to to uh, chop the alfalfa over that more rigid ridged uneven ground but yeah i'd be curious too feel free to type it in the chat or unmute if you've ever tried that or have experience in that but yeah i've heard those same concerns nate that the, the ground just is so uneven after that you know corn with cultivation it's just it's a tough tough go Did anyone have any problems with army worms on their alfalfa stands this this fall? And we we're talking about army worms at some point, but I I heard you know, there was some some talk about army worms really coming into some alfalfa stands, and like Chris had mentioned about the root rots. I mean, the theoretically the alfalfa could come back, but the the risk with you know alfalfa coming back is if there's stresses on it, like a root disease, or if it's you know really. Uh, kind of um, really <laughs> chopped to the ground, I guess. That's, that's, that stress is, is really gonna compromise it coming through the winter. So um, yeah, there's a lot of question in terms of whether or not there should be anything done with those fall army worms that, that came in on some of the 
the pasture alfalfa ground, but you know, it's too early to say obviously how it's gonna pull out of this winter, but yeah, curious if anyone saw that on, on any of their stands. Seemed to be a pretty widespread phenomenon, not just in Wisconsin, but across the Midwest and even going into the East Coast. So I'm sure we'll hear more about it into the spring. I know, I know, I know what is straight west of us in the Isle. Pretty heavy um, army wear impacts. We had some in our area, but we didn't have any impact, any of the fields that we found anyway um, on our stuff. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be fairly concentrated where maybe um, maybe it'd be a field and then for some reason, you know, if there was a tree break or whatever, the field over wouldn't be impacted. Um, so it was hard to necessarily, even talking with conventional producers, it was even, you know, maybe the trade-off on treatment with them was seemed like it, in many cases, wasn't worth it, at least by the time it got to us. Yeah, and I've heard the same thing, Chris. And yeah, it definitely wasn't a phenomenon that was isolated on organic. It was an issue I was seeing in the conventional news and uh, forums as well. So not just something organic farmers were experiencing and yeah, some of those same questions in terms of how to best manage it. It's just something we haven't seen a lot of before. What is the remedy for armyworms on the organic side? Yeah, that's a great question. And we'll have to ask Mary Barbercheck when she comes on a bit, a bit more about that. Or there's so much we, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, the impact of um, some alternative inputs, I guess, on um, insect management. I mean, if we're looking at kind of more of the, the trialed inputs, there's um, probably in trust and uh, um, VT are, are the most common um, or not most common, but probably the most trialed inputs. And we've used that on our, our no-till plots because you know army worms in the spring or something we see come on um, our no-till corn plots. So we've sprayed with Entrust and BT. And yeah, there's the most data supporting those two inputs. Um, and they, they can be quite effective if sprayed at the right time. But I know that there's a lot of kind of alternative approaches that are um, out there too, which I mean, there's just so much we need to learn in organic. I, I hate to say that they're, you know, they're not gonna work or they won't work in, in all situations or can't work in some situations, but there's, there's definitely less data with some of those more alternative approaches that of, you know, biologicals or managing with fertility or, or such, but in, in trust and BT certainly can be effective, but yeah, you kind of have to hit the, hit the larvae at the, the right stage of development. And it's costly. I mean, you have to yeah, weigh off the, the cost of those inputs too, because organic, any organic inputs aren't aren't cheap. Other questions or thoughts on organic alfalfa? Do you guys have a estimate? So if you're coming out of alfalfa, I know another question I often get is, you know, what are what are you considering the, the nitrogen credit? I mean, I guess on uh you know, dairy farms, you have the manure in the rotation at all. But I mean, Chris, I don't know. And again, some of your land that's further from the dairy and is a little bit more managed as a cash grain operation in some respects, because you don't have dairy manure. Do you have a certain number that you're thinking of in terms of the end credit that you're getting from that alfalfa? Um, I mean, in many cases, we feel if we have a good stain of alfalfa we're throwing in, we on our on our ground away from home um and again we're not trying to grow 200 bushel organic corn on it um we typically feel like there's enough end there to support the crop um you know a lot of times we're looking maybe to get an adder on it so if we that if it's a really good stand we turn it in you know 12 inches or taller you know that first year 100 and 40, 150 N probably from that, be, that in the natural, um, natural N that's there from soil organic matter and, and other things. Um, in that case, and then a second year credit, a lot of times if we're putting wheat behind corn, we figure in maybe another 40. Um, so, I, you know, in a year like this, where N is worth a buck a pound, that's, that's worth quite a bit. Yeah, that's a good point, Chris, that that end credit, you know, extends 
beyond just the the first year how are how uh how what is the interval between for both you guys alfalfa termination and then corn planting three weeks how how close is uh when I would, turn? yeah, I would say three weeks, maybe four at the most. Um, three, we usually get um, what we're terminating in the spring. We put manure on before we terminate it, uh, either liquid or um, pen pack of some sort. So that usually goes out first part of April. So we'll start terminating maybe like the twentieth, twenty fourth April, and then I guess I like to have corn in the ground about the, between the fifteenth and the twentieth of May. So. Um, depending on the year, I guess, uh, I would say three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty similar to us. Um, you know, this year we started, we, we try to get everything terminated by about that 10th of May. Um, and then if the ground temps are right, like this year we were planting corn around May 15th, but we're also, we tend to try to stay patient and especially a lot of our dairy manure ground tends to have a lot of weed pressure. So if you just plant, you know, if you plant when the ground's not ready, you pay the price from it um, on corn for us. So uh, if we know we have a really clean field, that's usually where we try to start. And I, so I would say, yeah, three weeks, two weeks, the latest between those intervals. Yeah, I think that three week interval is a, a nice spot um, because uh, too with um, uh, corn earworm, I believe it is that, um, and there are some models and I see Mike Bertram's on, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Eileen Cullen did some modeling or some just general, um, there, there are some more models um, that are out there to, to help estimate with growing um, degree units when to, terminate versus plant, but um, that's, that's a, it's kind of a two and a half week, three week window is a, a good um, interval for uh, avoiding some pest issues on the uh, seedlings. So um, Eric put in the chat that he's in the process of transitioning more grain acres in Northwest Ohio, and he's looking at using alfalfa clover for two years of production after wheat and there's a few or no organic dairy markets. It's hard to justify the high cost of alfalfa versus the lower cost of red clover. Um, these years are considered economic loss years for our operation. Our belief is that transition with red clover is less loss. Well, the same soil health legume value prior to organic corn. Um, so thoughts regarding, regarding that. Um, and just one other thought, this was something that came up and please others chime in on this as well. Um, I know, you know Bryce Earlbeck, who's speaking at um, some of our virtual workshops in a couple of weeks, he's a farmer in um, Iowa, but he, he uses alfalfa as part of the rotation. He speaks of, of how that's kind of a foundational part of his grain rotation. He's not a, a dairy or livestock farmer, but um, he does sell that on the conventional market. So, I mean, just because it's organic and in that, but this is probably silly for me to even say, but that that's an option too, to sell, to sell it conventionally. Um, and that when you're, as I kind of like Chris was just saying, when you factor in the, the end value um, that in the cost of organic N that you can still, you know, over on the grand scheme of things come up ahead. But yeah, it certainly is a, a challenge with, especially in areas where there's not necessarily a lot of organic dairies to kind of weigh the, weigh the kind of pluses and minuses. But yeah, if every other people have thoughts on that as well, clover versus alfalfa and uh, yeah, N credit or weed suppression, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I would uh, think too that, um, yeah, red clover um, in terms of the weed suppression and the end credit can be pretty substantial. So if, if you're looking at it more as a tool to um, use as a green manure, I think you know, red clover can be an extremely, um, extremely uh, useful and um, effective option there. There's a organic cash crop near me, a farmer that just does cash crops, and they plant quite a bit of red clover um, as a green manure crop uh, for their what will be corn the following year. 
Um, and I, I, I would agree if you're not going to have alfalfa in for a minimum of three years, I, it's probably not worth having um, over to Clover, I don't think. Um, the other thought would be is to add some livestock, I guess. <laughs> you can be a smart <laughs> <laughs> and the red clover does really well and i, I realize too that your organic uh grain markets for for cereal grains aren't necessarily the easiest to access to but um your red clover can do really well as in that interseeding kind of that underseeding that we were talking about before where you're able to go directly from a um a winter cereal grain, do a under seeding or frost seeding of that red clover. And then it, it's amazing how much growth it puts on once you get that cereal grain off and then you know, turn that under. I think you can get, you know, up to a 120 pounds of N off of that red clover, which is substantial going back into a corn crop. And we did some work, which we'll present on. I see my um, research scientist Ben Brockmiller is on of trying some different strategies. I know Leia Barak I thought was on too, and she's worked on this in my program for, for years as well about using no-tilling into red clover. And we actually had some decent results this year. So not only are you using that as an end source, but potentially managing that in a no-till situation. We'll keep moving forward. And again, certainly a lot of questions and, and risk there, but uh, um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Uh, question I got um, so for a cash from a crash from a cash cropper standpoint could he be um, interceding that clover uh, in a corn crop and then use that that clover as a cover crop that winter and then no-till is corn into it the following year. I mean, I know there's maybe some issues with the organic. Would that generate enough nitrogen the following year? I guess that's my question. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if, I think from a rotation standpoint, it, that wouldn't be from a certification standpoint, that wouldn't be an issue because you have that cover crop in there. It's not considered like a corn on corn phase. Um, and this is the case too with other cover crops. So I know there's some organic dairy farmers that will do corn into corn again, um, whether it be for grain or silage can vary, but like they'll do silage and then put in a rye cover crop and then go back into corn. And that's considered okay under most certifiers. I won't want to say all certifiers because there's a that's cover crop in do. there breaking it up. Yeah. Um, Red clover, if you're interseeding, we tried interseeding into, um, you know, corn at between like the V3, V5 stage. With corn, it's harder to get established because of the you know, same reasons we we're talking about with interseeding into rye that it, it it just, there's not a lot of sunlight coming through that corn. I mean, that that's a something we're fooling around with, with 60 inch corn or some, you know, varying ways of interseeding. And it's, it's, it's definitely risky to get that, um, to get to establish red clover into corn you're much better off doing it after a cereal grain um um and then yeah we're, we're still working on the how to no-till into it but we are making progress but in terms of a rotation standpoint just generally you can do corn one year corn the next year but you need a cover crop in between to break that up but again definitely contact your certifier because i don't want to say that that's true with all and that all certifiers interpret it that the same way. I mean, the, the regulations are the same for everyone, but sometimes certifiers can interpret things a little bit differently. Um, so Seth put in that he, um, yeah, and Chris and, and Nate as dairy farmers, maybe you can um, comment on this, religiously cut his alfalfa at 28 days, but is disappointed with the crude protein levels around 17%. Any of you have ideas of what might be some of the reasons for that? Question I ask myself every year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've gone to even cutting sometimes at 25 days uh, on a second or a third crop because of the heat and uh, we struggle to get 19 percent on them um, have for years and I don't know I've had conversations with other guys is it soil type that plays into it is it seed varieties that play into it so I'll talk to a neighbor that you know they're getting 21 22 percent is it something I'm doing wrong I don't know um, there's a million factors out there and I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, I, I couldn't say, you know, specifically, I know, I know for us, we, you know, crude protein is probably not a strong focus within, you know, what we necessarily are deciding whether it's good or bad. Um, 
we do see ground that maybe has lower fertility, typically has lower growth protein, um, especially on ground that we don't get a lot of manure back on. Um, so we do see a divide there, but 17% um, if you've got kind of other things in second, third, fourth crop, 17% if it's good digestibility and you're getting decent yield off of that, I, I guess I wouldn't worry too much about that that specific level 17 versus 19 or 20. I mean, we're typically 19 to 20 on second, third, fourth crop on average, but we'll have some 17s and we'll probably have some 2021s and it depends on the year too. Any other questions or comments for Nate or Chris or the group in general? This is always my favorite part of these workshops is just the conversation and the questions and the dialogue at the at the end and uh, it's always interesting to hear other people's experiences yeah i mean the one thing just kind of circling back to that alfalfa rotation i mean for us we've really we've we've experimented with corn after soybeans corn and um corn cover crop corn and um, the, the yield penalty for us has been pretty significant in, in those rotations versus a corn after alfalfa. Um, so even, you know, I think that the end is part of it, but in our area, we've, we've had to deal with pretty much disease pressure every single year. We have a fair amount of rootworm if, you, if you've got a grass on a grass. Um, I mean, I had a field that that I kind of changed the layout a little bit and it happened to go, you know, corn, rye, corn. And I mean, that section of the field was, had a third, you know, a third, a, a one third reduction in yield just in that section on that rotation versus the other section that was, that was alfalfa corn. So, you know, I think the end is part of it, but I think the overall that, that that rotation and, and the benefits from a disease pest pressure is pretty significant. This year, we had a lot of um, a lot of blight in the region, and uh, I mean it was in our fields. But I I would say I didn't really think that we had much of a yield impact. Certainly not as bad as what we saw in neighboring conventional fields that are typically corn and corn, um, where they didn't have that rotation effect. This year, our, ex, our best corn was second year corn. It had a rye cover crop that was pretty poor stand over winter. We put dairy manure on it and plant, that was planted, I think, June 7th or 6th after first cutting. And it was a 103 day foundation variety of silage. And uh, I don't know, it came out of the ground fast. And I think it was only one cultivation through there and it was clean. Uh, I'm, I say we lucked out on it, I guess, stuff, but uh, pretty impressed with it myself. Yeah, and I actually think uh, it did get about 4,000 gallons of dairy manure, too. So that, that yeah. definitely helps. Yeah, it's tough to beat good dairy manure. I just yeah. say that. Um, the one thing that we, we talk a lot about is just, you know, I think a lot of times on our farm that has a lot of corn silage, we, we probably. It, we would be served to wait. And just to your point, I mean, one of the best years of corn that we had was 2019 um, when the weather forced us to plant our first, first uh, bag of corn in June. And that crop was so clean and, and yielded, you know, one of our best yielding years because of that. Um, the challenge is, is on the backside of that, we also couldn't get our rye in we it just kind of messed up our rotation into 2020 so that's something for us we we juggle that question all the time and one thing i'm experimenting with is just keep pushing lower on our mature uh, days of maturity on corn and being willing to give up some of that top end yield to to, to you know wait longer in planning and, and hopefully still get it out in time in the fall yeah, that's a great point, Chris. I mean, there's always trade-offs. Like if you go early, 
sometimes it can work out quite well. Sometimes it's a little bit more, more challenges with weed management. So you could be use, losing yields both in that crop and with weed seed bank later. But you know the trade-off of planting late is if you're using the same hybrids and you're getting late in harvest, but then you know trading off with shorter season hybrids and losing some of the top yield. But then, it, yeah, but if you have weedy fields and you're losing yield there, so... A lot of, lot of trade-offs and just want to clarify, cause I always get this wrong. So the, the three week planting window be, be after a cover crop turnover is for seed corn maggot. I keep forgetting what that darn pest is, but it's seed corn maggot. And that's, that's where the models are. I know I've sent those out in the listserv before, um, but it's the seed corn maggot where you want to be careful in terms of when you terminate a cover crop or alfalfa and then come back in and plant corn. Cause uh, yeah, they can ex exacerbate seed corn maggot issues. Their questions and comments. It's been great seeing everybody. I'm, I'm excited to you know, see you all in virtual workshops and then hopefully some of you can come to the O'Grain Conference in Madison or I see you guys at Moses at our Organic University or other sessions. And if you have any um, you know, suggestions for any of workshops, we do have some Fridays that we could add things in. So always happy to um, you know, try to make sure that we're addressing issues that, that you guys are facing and has suggestions of speakers and topics, happy to pursue them. And yeah, thank you, Chris and Nate, for being our first speakers of the season. I, I know it's, uh, yeah, it's still a busy time of year and where the, it's not snow on the ground yet, at least in Southern Wisconsin. And um, just really appreciate you taking the time out to, to do this and share your knowledge and uh, be willing to get on Zoom and talk because it's, uh, I know it can be a little, um, not everyone's real thrilled about getting on Zoom and talking. So <laughs> really, really, really appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Have a great holiday and new year, too, because I don't know if I'll be seeing you guys before then. Our next topic is um, organic uh, weed management innovations, um, January 7th, and I'm lining up uh, speakers for that, but I'm sure we'll get some, some good uh, topics there. So great to see you. Thank you, Chris and Nate. No problem. Bye, everybody.